Hi everyone and welcome to the Deakin Alumni and Faculty Health Webinar with Dr. Olivia Dean. My name is Farisha Rahman from the Central Alumni Relations Team. Today we're broadcasting from Barwon Health in Geelong and our webinar topic today is What is Depression? Dr. Olivia Dean is currently Director of Impact Trials with the Centre for Innovations in Mental and Physical Health and Clinical Treatments and she is an NHMRC Research Fellow at Deakin University. She holds honorary appointments with the Florey Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health at the University of Melbourne and Barwon Health. Dr. Dean has over 80 publications and several successful grants, totaling over 8 million Australian dollars. Dr. Dean is committed to providing better treatment outcomes for people with mental disorders, and she's actively involved in ensuring her research reaches community forums and outcomes are directly translated into clinical practice. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Olivia Dean. I'm going to pass over to you now to begin our webinar presentation. Great, thanks very much, Rusha. Um, today's presentation is titled, What is Depression? And it provides an overview of um, the state of play in depression research. Um, and some tidbits on where to get some more information. Um, I've tried to keep the presentation fairly um, concise because I found that often there's quite a lot of questions and so I've tried to leave um, sufficient time to uh, allow for those questions. Um, so the um, opening to this presentation is um, really one of the, what's become a really familiar face and that's Chester Bennington. Um, who was the lead singer of Lincoln Park, or one of them, um, who unfortunately um, ended up suiciding um, and his wife presented this picture and a series of other pictures, basically just displaying that it, depression doesn't have a face. It's not the stereotypical sad looking person and that really it's important that we all look out for each other because depression can, can really affect anyone at any time. Um, and here's a good example of that. I mean, you can see that he's quite unhappy and everything seems to be going well. And that was actually the last photo that they took of him uh, before how he lost his life. So what does depression look like? I think this is a really good example. It is all of us. You look in a mirror and you will see someone with depression. If not today, maybe tomorrow. Everyone will experience a depressive episode um, or know someone that's experienced a depressive episode over the course of their life. It affects one in five people, so that's 20%. So if you're sitting in a room with five people, one of them is having a depressive episode or has done in the past. So I think it's really important to acknowledge that depression affects everyone, whether it's uh, directly or indirectly. But what is depression? And what's the difference between depression, sadness and grief? It's a question I get asked a lot um, and I guess obviously there, there's no um, difference between them but when you start to think about really teasing apart the symptoms and the, the appearance of the three, um, depression has its own categories and um, symptoms that make it separate from grief and sadness. And the two biggest issues are impairment and duration. So for example, um, a person might experience um, the death of their partner, they go through a grieving process and they're quite sad and that can be, um, it can be quite um, you know, significant to the person but it doesn't impair them or it doesn't have a, a significant duration of impairment that leads them to have a dysfunction or a disorder in their life and so that's what we would consider usual grief. But sometimes that spills over into something else and it becomes much more serious in terms of its, its effect on people. Um, and then oftentimes the next step is to actually seek some, some formalised assessment and some treatment. There are two uh, types of depression that are characterised um, in the psychiatric literature and that's bipolar and unipolar depression. And the question I get asked is, aren't they all the same? And, Depression's depression, isn't it? So how are these different? So a little bit of the book of what we, or what I call, I shouldn't say we, uh, what I call the Bible of diagnoses uh, for psychiatric illnesses. So for those of you who aren't aware, there is a book out there called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, 
that is the guidelines for psychiatrists to make diagnosis and that provides the categories and the descriptors regarding what people need to meet in terms of their disorder and, and their um, feeling um, to actually fit into a, a diagnosis and then receive appropriate treatment. So the DSM-5 characterises um, usual or clinical depression as major depressive disorder um, and it can be both um, single and recurrent. And the usual pattern is recurrence where people will have continuing episodes with a period of recovery in between. There are several subtypes of these and I've left them on there for just to illustrate the point, but I think it's, I don't think it makes any, um, any more information if I go through them all, but I thought just in case anyone wanted to have a look. And this is contrasted against the bipolar diagnosis. So bipolar disorder is characterized by two general um, categories, and that's bipolar 1 and bipolar 2. There are other um, related disorders, and they've been listed here as well. Um, the two major disorders are bipolar 1 and 2. The difference between them is that one is characterized by episodes of florid mania. The other one is characterized by what is called hypermania. So it's, for those of you unaware, mania is the um, elevation of mood to a point that it becomes, you know, excessive. Um, and so people that experience hypermania have some of those elevated mood symptoms, but they don't meet full criteria for a, man a manic episode. Importantly, though, the contrast to this is that bipolar disorder has a depressive phase. So people experience generally um, a mania followed either by a recovery and then a depressive phase or a mania followed by a depression and so on and so forth. The treatments currently are um, try to stabilise that mood and they're called mood stabilisers. But what we found at the moment is the mood stabilisers are really good at treating the mania symptoms but not so good at treating the depression symptoms. I'll just move to the next slide. So it's important to understand, A, that depression is a medical disorder, just like diabetes or hypertension. It needs to be recognised appropriately and then treated accordingly. So if you had a friend that had hypertension, you would know that they could go and have a test for hypertension, and once they get a diagnosis, there's a clear treatment, and you as a, as a person would understand that they need to have sensitivities around that hypertension. So for instance, you wouldn't feed your friend a bag full of salt because you know that's going to cause the blood pressure to have problems. And I think more and more, we uh, as humans are becoming much more aware of the importance of mental health and mental illness and the fact that this is just a part of our medical condition like any other um, disorder or disease. So what are the appropriate treatments and are all depressions treated the same? Well, no, at the moment there is a difference um, in the treatment and it seems in the underlying biology between major depression or clinical depression and bipolar depression. So the current treatments for major depression are predominantly at the moment antidepressants and psychotherapy. And these seem to be relatively, uh, they seem to be useful for a, a large proportion of people um, requiring treatment for their major depression. Conversely, the current treatments for bipolar depression are largely, largely mood stabilizers, as I mentioned before. And mood stabilizers are a class of medication on their own. Um, and they're quite different to the way antidepressants work. And I mentioned earlier that bipolar depression is not very well treated by current mood stabilizers. So the question often arises, why don't you just give people who are experiencing bipolar depression antidepressants? Because antidepressants fix major, major depression for a lot of people. Why can't we just give antidepressants to people with, di with bipolar depression? Unfortunately, the answer isn't clear, but there is still a, a lot of debate over the use of antidepressants for people with bipolar depression. And it seems to be related to the underlying biology and differences in the actual disorders. So I'm going to show you quite a intricate set of diagrams, but don't worry, I've simplified it all out. So you can follow, hopefully. This is the current um, understanding of the underlying biology of bipolar depression. So these factors contribute to um, the development of the disorder. 
It looks very similar to the diagram that's very busy about unipolar or major depression. Um, and as I said, don't worry about having to read all of this. You don't need to. I will show you the important bits. There are commonalities between the two. So we've got genetic factors, systemic or other medical conditions that may contribute, environmental factors, um, cellular damage, uh, in, in this case, brain cell damage, uh, neuronal changes, which is also called neuroprogression, and functional outcomes. Um, so people have cognitive impairment and follow-on effects following their diagnosis. These look exactly the same in both disorders. However, it seems to be that while there are commonalities between the two disorders and overlaps in their underlying biology, the weighting and impact of each of these factors seems to be different in the two disorders. So for instance, inflammation is current, currently believed to be central to the pathophysiology of major depression. I should have clarified that, that's a typo in the slide, um, or clinical depression. Whereas oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction are believed to be central in the pathophysiology of bipolar depression. These are theories at this stage, and there is um, a large body of work that's being invested into teasing out the differences in the underlying biology. What's interesting to note is that there is face value validity for both of these um, concepts. So, for instance, we know that if you give um, treatments to people uh, that cause a increase in the amount of cytokines or inflammatory factors in their blood, they will actually develop depressive symptoms. So that, that's really interesting. And in terms of bipolar depression, we know at face value that bipolar disorder is a energy production, um, has issues with energy production. So for instance, people experiencing manic episodes have high energy and a lot of energy and, and very little need for sleep. Whereas on the flip side, when they're depressed, they experience very low amounts of energy and really have um, problems getting themselves moving. So there's face validity to suggest that the mitochondria, which are the energy powerhouses of the brain cells, might actually be involved in bipolar disorder. So this is where the work at IMPACT trials comes in. Um, we are a team that is devoted to exploring novel therapies and the underlying biology of mostly affective disorders, so depression um, and bipolar, major depression and bipolar disorder. Current treatments for major depression result in approximately 30% of people are achieving full remission, which is great. Um, but what it suggests is that 70% of people don't achieve full remission. Um, which is surprising for a lot of people. And one of the reasons that I like to really um, talk about depression is because I think people assume that antidepressants are the answer. And if they're not, well, psychotherapy will fill the gap or vice versa. Psychotherapy is the answer and that antidepressants will fill the gap. Unfortunately, while both are effective and very good in combination, they don't generally tend to result in full recovery for everyone. And that's the key. It's about full recovery. And this is where IMPACT trials really steps in. Um, I'm happy to discuss any of the trials on the diagram if you want, but for the in the interest of time and the fact that I want to give you guys a lot of time to ask questions, I'm going to move on. Some of the key um, agents that we have uh, that we're currently trialling at IMPACT trials are N-acetylcysteine, which is um, an amino acid derivative and has gained some interest lately um, with our recent study that we're investigating looking at methamphetamine or ice addiction. So some of you may have seen the recent um, press around the new study looking at um, recruiting people trying to get off methamphetamine. Um, so this is a really interesting little molecule. We've used it predominantly for people with um, bipolar depression and found that it's useful um, in assisting in closing that gap. So we give it to people who are on current treatments and we call it an adjunctive therapy, which means it's an add-on to whatever people are doing usually. And as you can see by the diagram, there are a lot of the factors that I mentioned earlier in the busy diagram that are repeated here. And that's really why we thought it might be useful. Similarly, we have been trialing minocycline, which is an old antibiotic. Um, some of you may be familiar with its sister doxycycline, which is a very highly prescribed antibiotic. Um, it's a tetracycline, as is minocycline. 
Interestingly though, minocycline has properties that are independent of it being an antibiotic. So it inhibits or dampens down the activation of brain cells responsible for inflammation in the brain. So what it can show is that if you give minocycline in a variety of models, you can reduce the amount of inflammation in the microglia or the brain inflammatory cells, which is really interesting. What's also interesting and wasn't my initial, um, wasn't part of my initial line of research, but has become more and more important is obviously it is an antibiotic, which means it has effects on gut microflora. And given the state of play at the moment around the microbiome and the um, interest in resident bacteria and also viruses, the, you know, the interest in minocycline, I think, will grow more and more. And it may be, in fact, that there are, there is a mechanism of action through its changing the microflora of being an antibiotic that actually increases or, or um, is relevant to the pathophysiology of depression. That was a very big mouthful. So to simplify, <laughs> basically what I'm trying to say is, is that it's an antibiotic that might have effects on the gut. These might actually be beneficial for people with depression. There is a assumption that if you wipe out the gut uh, microflora with antibiotics, that that's bad. But there is also a new line of research that is postulating or, or hypothesizing that antibiotic use could reset micro, resident microflora and actually start a system in a better way again. These things I can't talk to you about in full today. I'm sure um, Felice Jacker will have very many things to say about that, but I'd be more than happy to ask, answer any questions that you might have, at least within the scope of the research that I'm doing. One of the other agents that I'm particularly interested in is mangosteine um, or the mangosteine pericarp. So a mangosteine is a Southeast Asian fruit. It's also known as the queen of fruits because of the delicious taste of the pulp inside. So you actually eat the white bit. Um, I personally don't like it. So <laughs> that's just a tidbit of useless information. It tastes something like a cross between a lychee and a mandarin. Um, so it, it, it does lend itself to being a, a very nice fruit. But the bit we're interested in is the, is the red bit that you can see in the picture here. So that's the husk. Um, and we call it the pericarp. So fruits have natural abilities to protect themselves. They have to in order to survive and, and procreate like humans. What's interesting about the mangosteen pericarp is that it's got a really thick, very protective husk which is very useful at being um, at resisting inflammation and infection by pests. And so when we looked at what was actually in the inside of the pericarp, which has been used as the traditional medicine for quite a long time, um, we found that it had bioactive agents that might be useful for bipolar depression. So we're currently trialling that. Um, the trial's running in Melbourne, Geelong and Brisbane, and we're looking for people to take part in that study. Um, as I said, it's for people with bipolar depression. Um, and we're going to be recruiting probably over the next 12 months, so there'll be plenty of opportunity. Coming around to, the, I guess, the, the final third of my presentation, so as you can see, we are flying through. Um, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time on impacts aims to engage the community and translate our research. So why is this important? Well, there's a lot of reasons this is important. One of the issues that I have is that I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a clinician. So I spend a lot of my time trying to engage the community to translate my findings because I don't have patients that I can, I can directly translate them to. I also spend a lot of time talking to psychiatrists, um, policy makers and those sorts of people to try and um, inform them about the research that's going on. But some of the other things that we're doing to help engage both both ways, so both to um, disseminate the research, but also to get input on the research from the community, um, is through the activities I have listed here. So we have a online program of research being conducted by Leslie Burke that's called My Maps, which is a um, direct translation of some group research that she did. And she's taken that to an online format to then roll it out for people with bipolar disorder. So that's a really nice example of how the research is now being rolled out into actually, you know, into something that people can access. 
We have a community and research network, which is a group of people that meet twice a year um, from a variety of areas. So we have people from stakeholder organisations such as Keringle, sorry, GenU. Um, we have um, service providers such as people from Barwon Health. We have people um, from Deakin. We also have people that are um, just interested in taking part or, or may have their own research or translation activities going on. So I encourage everyone to have a look at the Community and Research Network Facebook page. It's also called Khan, because Khan, we can all do it. <laughs> and um, I welcome everyone to join us. We also hold a variety of public forums. So we have World by Holiday, which is March 30th every year. Um, and we hold a, a Q&A session, which is the, the picture in the bottom right panel, where we have a variety of experts with from a clinician, a researcher, and a person with a lived experience who get up there and, and give a presentation, and then they um, receive questions about their experience. And we also have our Mental Health Week Trivia Night coming up, which is a great um, event that allows us to both create awareness and reduce stigma around mental illness, and also to help raise funds for the Ian Parker Bipolar Research Fund, which is a um, research fund that we work closely with and is supporting several of our students at the moment. Uh, that research fund is in collaboration with Rotary Health, and I'd encourage everyone to have a look at donating. We're always happy to take donations. We also engage with key stakeholders. So in addition to the work that we do at Khan, I spend a lot of time actually going out there and speaking to people one-on-one -on -one as much as I can. We have a new alliance with the Geelong Music Community Collective, um, which is a group of local Geelong musicians that have decided to get together. Uh, following the death of Chris Cornell, they wanted to do a tribute. Um, they did. They raised money for the Impact SRC and have done several events since then. And to date, they've raised over $4,000 and sent four of our students to conferences. So that's been a wonderful initiative, born out of pure grassroots community support. Um, so those guys are amazing. That's the overview of the MyMaps program. Um, so basically, they Leslie has taken a group face-to-face -face, um, sessions and personalised it into an app. And she's also taking it to carers as well. So that's going to be really interesting. Here is the community and research newsletter. So if you don't want to be part of the actual um, community and research network, you can sign up for our newsletter. Um, our current chair, Adam, is more than happy to take your details. And you can see that we've had a variety of things going on there. The other thing that's really useful about the newsletter is it provides an opportunity for reciprocal information. So stakeholders of all varieties are welcome to submit something. Um, and then it will be circulated to our research network as well as our community network. So we found that to be a really valuable tool to not only enhance the impact of our research going out, but to actually get good impact input sorry, on the research that we're conducting so we know that what we're doing is actually going to be helpful to the people we're trying to help. I'm the current chair of the Australasian Society for Bipolar and Depressive Disorders, and we held our conference in 2017. I'm always up for a free, free opportunity to spruce the, the society, so I'm going to take it. Um, but interestingly, in March next year, so in um, 2019, the International Society for Bipolar Disorders is holding their conference in Sydney. So it will be the ASBDD will be supporting the ISBD, um, which is the International Society, for their Sydney meeting. Um, and it's a, a really good opportunity for Australian researchers um, and, and people that are interested in bipolar disorder to actually access an international forum that isn't in Europe or in America, which is where they usually are. Um, so I'd encourage everyone to have a look at the ISBD website and, um, and to get involved. The ASBDD is always looking for new members and um, we'd be more than happy to receive, uh, inf uh, to, sorry, to send out information for anyone interested. What about getting help? 
So we've spoken about what is depression, how you might treat it, some of the new research, and how we translate our research. But what if you need some help? You know, I'm sure there's plenty of people out there that's, that have logged on today to actually seek some treatment. And sometimes it's not easy to to get that treatment. It may be that it's readily available. It's just difficult for people that are experiencing symptoms of depression to actually reach out and get help. So I've listed some obvious um, sources of referral. So going to speak to your GP, looking at support groups, um, you know, and there's other bigger ones out there like Beyond Blue and the Black Dog. Um, your local mental health service will have an access number. So you can Google that and literally you can type your area and access mental health and you should get an access number that will give you immediate help. There are also support lines such as Lifeline. There's also the easy one. And Are You OK Day really, um, I guess, brought this to the forefront, but it's something that we should be doing every day. It's not hard to ask someone and mean it. Are you OK? I see you're not doing well today. Is there anything I can do to help? You don't have to be a mental health first aider. You just have to be a human being. And then you can provide assistance such as saying, well, maybe you'd like to call someone or maybe you don't have to get involved. You just have to be a human, be supportive. Um, and I think everyone, if everyone did that, we'd be working more towards reducing stigma and, and having open discussions about mental health and mental illness, just like we do about hypertension and diabetes. So if you want to contribute to our research, please sign up for our research database. If you're interested in taking part in our studies, we have a research database and I can send out any anyone that's interested the um, patient information and consent form. Please come along to our events. The trivia night um, will be open for booking soon. Follow us on Twitter at Impact SRC. Contribute to our research funding and always lobby your local government. Every time there's an election, there are mental health promises. Every time the election goes through, those promises change. We need you to be the loud voice for us. We can't scream loud enough on our own. So to finish up, Stigma. I know I've said it a lot, but it's really important to me that we reduce stigma. They look like you and I because they are. These are three people that have come out and spoken about their experience with depression. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, the, the first panel is Sinead O'Connor, um, who had a, a very raw video put on, on YouTube about her experiences. Um, and Gary McDonald and Liesl Jones, who have all had, you know, brilliant careers and, and have, have really taken the step to say, like any other physical illness, you can have a mental illness and still go on and do everything else. And in fact, you might have benefits that other people don't have. There's always been suggestions about, you know, the, uh, the artistic fields and the, the link with mania, for instance. So final thoughts. This is our team at the last Christmas party. That's why we all look so happy and joyous in the sun on ensuring that we take care of our own mental health as well as everyone else's. And finally, uh, another plug for the trial that we're currently recruiting for. So if you would like some more information on the Mangosteen trial, please get in touch with me. And there's all the contact details. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Olivia Dean. Um, that was a really informative presentation. It's now time for our discussion session with our audience, so I'll leave a couple of minutes for you to type in your questions now. Okay, we've got our first question from Julie. I'm interested in diet affecting depression. <laughs> Would you be able to comment on this? Sure. Um, thanks, Julie. So if you're not already aware, um, Felice Jacker is the diet and mood extraordinaire. She is um, one of the leaders in the field internationally about diet and mood. Um, so I, I will give you the short answer, and that is there are clearly links between improved diet, oh, sorry, good diet and improved mental health. The conundrum for a lot of people is, is that when you're feeling the most depressed, it's very hard for you to eat well because eating well is one of the last things you're really considering and you just want to eat something to get the job done. Um, and so that's something that I think is going to take a little more exploration. 
But on the flip side, I think more and more clinicians are addressing the fact that diet and exercise are an important part of mental health. And so that's becoming more and more part of the treatment plan. Thank you. Um, Julie's also commented that she's currently suffering from post-concussion syndrome, and I've also been diagnosed with depression. So I'm interested in the comment about inflama inflammation of the brain currently um, being believed to be a central pathophysiology of depression. Sure, great question. Um, okay, so... I am not an expert in the field of concussion research, so I can't really comment on that. But having said that, I love the fact that you've linked the two together and that there there may be a link between the um, concussion and the and the brain damage associated with that and, and then the development of the depressive symptoms. The causal links between that are unclear because I don't know the ins and outs of your particular case and I also don't know the ins and outs of the pathophys of concussion. Um, so what, what can I say? I will say that the, what we can see in the inflammation in depression, in unipolar depression or major depression, seems to be very low grade. So while you can drive depressive symptoms by really um, overloading the system, the general pathophysiology of people with major depression is that it's low grade systemic inflammation and it becomes really difficult to then tease out a, that there's inflammation there, and B, what effect it's having. So we're working on that at the moment, and unfortunately that's as much information I, I can provide at this point. Thank you so much, Dr Olivia. We've got um, a comment and a question from Ajit. Excellent presentation. How do you see the field of depression research moving in the next five years? Any views on TMS? Oh, TMS. Thanks, Ajit. Um, I'm... So TMS is a field that's moving forward. For those who don't know, it's, it's transmagnetic stimulation. Um, it involves um, magnets being placed on the outside of a person's head and then their brain being stimulated. Um, the field's moving. So I think more and more we're going to see novel therapies being brought out, by, especially by clinicians. And I think that's really what drove the TMS field too. In terms of treatment options, I don't know enough about the state of play of TMS. I know it's been trialled successfully in some places and that there's ongoing work with it. But where do I see the field in five years? I really think that the biggest change that we're going to see in the next five years is that we're going to find better markers to explore the underlying biology. And that's going to be central in producing better outcomes for treatments for people with depression. Thank you. Our next question from Laura. What are some books or articles that you would recommend to broaden understanding of depression? Um, okay, so there's quite a few out there. Um, uh, Leslie Burke's program has been published into a book, so if anyone wants to look at that, that's available. There is some great literature out there by um, some of the larger organisations um, you know, such as Beyond Blue, that put out very easy-to-read information sheets um, that provide you with references that then you can then follow up. So I would suggest that, that a place like that's a good place to start um, to get sort of that broad information, and it also gives you a path to lead down if you want some more specific information. Sure, thank you. Our next question from Peter. What is your experience with propranolol? Did I pronounce that correctly? Close enough. <laughs> um, to control explosive mood, anger triggers completely out of control by the person. Okay, so there has been, um, as far as I'm aware, pro propanolol, I also can't <laughs> say it, um, isn't currently widely used in clinical practice. Now, forgive me if I'm incorrect, but that's, that's my understanding. Um, it, I have seen clinical trials that have been reported um, using it, but nothing that I've seen that seems to be earth shattering or groundbreaking. So I don't think it's widely used. I think there are other options out there that are more widely used. Um, so unfortunately, that's about as much as I can comment on that. I wish I was an expert in everything. <laughs> sure, thank you. Um, our next question from Cameron. Can you talk a little bit more about the NAC dosages and protocol that's being used? Sure. So. Um, NAC or N-acetylcysteine is currently registered in Australia as a medicine at doses above one gram and as a health supplement below one gram. And this has caused 
a lot of confusion for a lot of health food suppliers. So bringing it in has become interesting, uh, to say the least. You can get it from a series of compounding pharmacists and you can ask a compounding pharmacist to compound it for you or you can buy it online. I don't recommend any particular source because I can't comment on the rep on the quality of the products being sent, but I do know that's the easiest way to source it. In terms of dosing and regimen, as a health supplement, I can't recommend anyone take anything over one gram because I can't recommend a medicine dose. But what I can tell you is that in our studies, we've used two grams, one gram twice a day, um, for a period of 16 weeks in unipolar or major depression and for a period of six months in bipolar depression. And what we found is that it takes really at least eight weeks to see an effect. And we think that that might be related to the downstream changes that this medication is having on top of usual treatment. So I need to reiterate that all of our trials are conducted on top of treatment as usual. So people stay on whatever they're doing and then take the N-acetylcysteine on the top of that. Um, and that's the protocol that we've been following. Thank you. Our next question from Helen. My question is, how to identify if a teenager is depressed and how do we talk to them to start? Sure. I think parents increasingly, or not even increasingly, parents generally um, struggle with their teenagers and, and the lines of communication with teenagers can often be limited. Um, but I also think more and more teenagers are, are more aware of their mental health and and are more likely to actually seek help. And, and there was a recent study completed that actually showed that one of the leading issues for adolescents at the moment was their mental health above their physical health. So there's a whole shift, um, I think, in the recognition of mental illness, even in teenagers. So they're more likely to have that conversation with you. But if they're not and you're worried about them, you can suggest that they speak to a health professional or you could even um, suggest that they go and see, go to a centre such as Headspace, which are specifically designed to assist teenagers and, and adolescents in, in um, promoting their mental health and recognising if they've got a mental illness. Um, so that would be my, my advice. Sometimes it's hard for parents to get involved and I think having open conversations about why it's important and the support that you want to provide um, is, is great. Um, and also if you can get involved with one of their friends, that also generally helps to get them involved with Headspace and those sorts of things because they're more likely to listen to their peers. So that would be my pieces of advice. Yeah, thank you, Olivia. That was a um, good, good piece of advice. Our next comment from Rachel. Thank you, Olivia, for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Would it be possible to have access to P Felice Jacker's presentation? So I can answer that one. <laughs> um, that is available on our um, webinar and resources page on the Deakin website. Um, Juanita is asking about the Facebook page that you mentioned. What was that called? Sure, it's the Community and Research Network Facebook page. Okay. Um, I'm pretty sure it's listed as Community and Research Network and also as CARN, which is C-A-R-N. Sure. Um, and it's our, um, it's the Facebook page for the network, but you can actually join the network and be part of the newsletter. So those two things are independent. Thank you. Um, our next question from Liang. Ex is exercise a treatment for mental health? Um, oh, that's a sticky one. Yes, is the short answer, but it's never a short answer. So mental health requires a really holistic approach. Even for people that don't have a mental disorder, staying mentally healthy requires a, a variety of activities. And I would suggest that exercise is one of the things that helps keep us mentally well. Thank you. Um, our next question, what are the links between ADLs and or work and depression. Okay, so ADLs are adjusted. Thank you. <laughs> I've, got, I've got helpers in the in the background. Um, activities thank you. Activities of daily living. I knew it was the measure of the amount of burden that a person experiences following their health problem. We, I have a sneaky health literacy person in the background here with me. Um, 
So how is that related to depression? Um, Sorry, I'm... What are the links between ADLs and work and depression? Okay, so I guess the question's a little um, hard to answer because I'm not really sure what what, what parts you're, you're getting at. So there's an impairment that would... Some people have an impairment and that may or may not impact on their work. Um, and I think more and more in the workplace, their work people are becoming much more sensitive to people with mental health issues. And so I think the discussions are becoming better. So people hopefully moving forward will be able to stay in work even if they're experiencing a disability. Sure, thank you. Our next question from Arthur. Do you engage with Mental Health First Aid Australia? I have links with Mental Health First Aid Australia through the CAR network, funnily <laughs> enough. Um, so yes. <laughs> thank you. Our next question from Naki. Sleep deprivation, low mitochondrial equals depression, lack of energy. That is a physical process. I'm not sure what the question okay, is. Okay, so um, um, there are links between sleep deprivation and energy generation, and there are links between energy generation and depression, but I am not sure about the links between the three. So I'm just not going to... I think that was the question, but I can't answer it. Okay. <laughs> Our next question from Jenny. How do you help someone who don't think they have depression but has had a few sessions with a psychiatrist and did not go through? Yeah, so this is um, something that that a lot of people experience and that's that their loved one has uh, attempted to get some, some treatment and has either found that it wasn't suitable and they don't want to do it anymore or... Um, they feel like they've recovered and, and everything's great again. Um, what I would suggest is that as much as you can, you have a conversation with the person about why you think it might be useful for them to go and seek further treatment and the fact that there are alternate options. So for a lot of people, seeing a psychiatrist is just too daunting or they feel like they're not quite sick enough. Um, and it's fine to see a psychiatrist even if you don't think you're sick enough because that's their job, you know. Um, but there are other options out there. So you can see a psychologist, your general practitioner. More and more, the general practitioners are doing wonderful work in mental health. Um, and, and a lot of people only see their general practitioner and don't see a psychiatrist or a psychologist. But my advice would be try and, and suggest that they speak to someone that they trust about ways that they could go and seek treatment that will work for them. So I think it, mental health is so individual that the, the treatment options need to be laid out as individually as well. Thank you. Our next question from Penny. I'm wondering if the fruit husk being tested for mental health effects has been used for depression in traditional medicine. Okay, um, it may have been. Um, and this is something that I really want to explore further and that's um, in the so uh, me as a, as a Western world researcher basically I get most of my information from a source called PubMed which is the place that scientists list the literature that they've published. The issue with the sources like PubMed is that it doesn't pick up traditional medicines that are never published because that's not the way that cultural things work in other cultures or that they're just not recognized as being science and so those things are never published um so it could be the case that yes it has been used for depression but i'm just not aware of it and one of the things that i hope to do in the future is to spend more time trying to speak to people who use traditional medicine so i can get a better understanding of the science that hasn't been published basically Sure, thank you. And if there's anyone out there who has have um, who has used traditional medicine, please do get in touch with Olivia. Um, we've got about ten more minutes, but there's a lot of questions coming through, so we're going to try answer as many as we can sure. in the next ten minutes. Um, our next question from Ayana, in um, regarding environmental issues impacting on one's life and being the cause of very deep depression, how content with How content with if inescapable causes? Okay, um, I think there's a few words missing there, but um, 
I understand that for a lot of people, their environmental factors have a significant contribution to their mental health. And for uh, I, I can't be sitting here and going to say that I can solve everyone's problems because I can't. I don't know what everyone's individual circumstances are and I don't know how they can be improved or not improved accordingly. I do recognise, though, that people feel a frustration with their environmental factors often that they feel that they can't change. Um, but I think in that case, what I would suggest is that they speak to their support networks if they have them or to their professional networks and seek advice and tools that might help assist in either changing their situation or coping with the situation better so that they don't end up in a depressive phase. Thank you. Um, we've got another question about the mangosteen trial. So how will you be extracting the husk from the mangosteen for your treatment? Will it be used as a tablet or a liquid? Yep. So the husk is removed from the fruit and someone eats the fruit, I'm guessing. <laughs> and um, it goes through an extraction process. Um, the resultant it ends up as a freeze-dried powder and that freeze-dried powder gets capsulated and then we give capsules to our participants. Cool, thank you. Our next question um, from Colette. If treatment of bipolar from GPs is not always appropriate, what is being done to educate GPs on this? Um, I'm going to just go with the second part of the question <laughs> and that is what is being done to educate GPs. Yeah. Um, so the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners has um, a series of activities around upskilling their GPs in mental health. Um, and there's a lot of professional development that's been going on in that area probably over the last five to ten years. Sure. Um, GPs, like everyone, are recognising that in order to create a healthy human being, we actually have to address both physical and mental health. And so trying to tease or trying to treat the two independently just isn't going to work anymore. And I think that's going to be a big um, help in actually producing better outcomes for people with both physical and mental health disorders. Thank you. Our next question. I'm curious about genetics role in depression. My husband has this depression and I've been suffering depression as well. What are the chances of our future offspring getting depression? Sure. Um, unfortunately, the genetic causality or the links between familial depression and offspring depression aren't clear. So we know that people who have a family member with depression are more likely to have a depressive episode or to have a mental illness. But we haven't got to a point yet where we can select out which genes or which change genes are going to indicate that someone will have depression or not. So, and the other thing is, is that at this stage, we don't know what sort of effect genetics has on the outcome overall. So it's a twofold problem. We can't suggest which genes may be problematic so that if you added your, your genes with your partner's genes, this would be the combination that might be problematic. But also we can't say that because you have depression and your partner has depression, that your children will have depression. Um, yes, there is an increased risk, as I said, but we don't know what effect the genetic load has on that risk or whether or not there are other factors that are actually contributing to the risk separate to the genetics. Um, I know it's not a clear answer. Uh, unfortunately, we're just not there yet, but I am involved in a series of research projects, one of which is currently looking at over 10,000 people with major depression to answer this question. How much of it, of the genetic load actually impacts on developing the disorder? Sure. Thank you for that, Olivia. Our next question, is depression actually more prevalent than it used to be, or is the diagnosis more accurate these days? I'm a teacher and there seems to be a lot more of my students with depression. Uh, the answer to that is yes. So both are true. Um, we think that it may be the case that the incidence of depression has increased over time, but there's also reports clearly that the reporting of depression is much more common now and that it's being recognised much earlier. Um, so for instance, the 
you know, the treatment of adolescent depression, I think, is much more common now than it was before. But I think that's because the stigma around adolescent depression has has reduced and people don't look at, at adolescents and just say, well, you're, you're just being a usual teen. You know, there is a recognition that there are usual teen behaviours and that teenagers have angst and these are parts of the developmental phases, but there are also teens that suffer much more above that and actually have a mental disorder. Um, so, yes, both are true. Thank you. Our next question, is NAC safe for children and are there any side effects? Um, NAC has been tested in children and um, there's quite a number of studies out there at the moment looking at NAC for the treatment of autism. Um, so it has been used in children before. I can't remember the second part of that question, sorry. Um, any side effects? Oh, uh, yeah. And yes, there are side effects. The most common ones are gastrointestinal, so people either experience diarrhea or constipation. And we have also had reports of reflux. Um, these generally can be managed with usual reflux treatments. Um, and for some people, the, the side effects just seem to dissipate over time. For some people, it just becomes intolerable and they can't take it, but I think that's true of any medication. It's very rare, though. Thank you. Um, a lot of questions about whether this, the session was recorded. Yes, um, the webinar has been recorded and will be available on our website in the next two weeks. Um, we're almost out of time, so I think we'll just do one more last question. Are you aware of any research being done around the effects of people engaging in social connections on decreasing depression? Um, so, yes, there is research going on about social connect connectedness and depression. Um, it's a very broad field, so there's no specific study I could um, particularly point you to, but some of the, the work that we're, we're doing here at IMPACT, um, especially with the online um, program of research, so looking at online interventions, is the role of um, things like discussion boards and, and um, forums for people with mental illness to actually have social interactions with each other. Given the fact that we are moving or we have moved to a much more electronic society, I think the relevance of that is going to be really important. Um, and so while the, the field itself is massive, the, the work that we're doing in the online space I think is really interesting. Thank you so much, Dr. Olivia. Um, and thank you for our audience today for tuning in and participating. We've got, we had a lot of great questions. Um, apologies if we couldn't get through to your question. Um, but you can email Dr. Olivia on her email address displayed on the screen. Um, and a recording um, will be available on our website within the next few weeks. Have a great day, everyone, and we hope you can join us again next time.